Hello everyone, I hope you are well and healthy. Welcome to the webinar Chemical Engineering at NASA, an event brought to you by AICH Brazil during the Brazilian Science and Technology Week. I am Marcos Felipe, I am a chemical engineering undergraduate student from Brazil, and I'm also a member of the Brazilian AICH, AICH student chapter, and that's why I'm here representing uh, the AICH Brazil to say thanks to Mr. Collins for accepting our invite and to NASA for allowing us to have this conversation with you. Uh, as this is our first international online event, I'd like to introduce you to what is AICG Brazil. We are a union between the, all the AICG student chapters in Brazil. Currently, we are a total of 13 student chapters of the Centenary Leading Global Organization for Chemical Engineering Professionals aiming to have access to information about process, recognized and promising chemical engineering methods, connections to a global network of colleagues and learning opportunities. As I said, currently we are 13, but I'm happy to say that this number is getting bigger and will get bigger soon. As you can see in the screen, we have all the logos that represent the 13 Brazilian student chapters. And today we have a talk with Jacob Collins, uh, he is uh, a chemical engineer that we are were able to invite for NASA, and he'll say he'll say to us a little bit of his path in his career and what can he do in NASA. So that's it. You know us now. Let us know who are you, where are you from, what do you study, and what made you get interest in being here today. We will follow the comments during all the presentation and read the questions and comments to Jake to Mr. Collins in appropriate moments. I hope you all enjoy and make this a uh, pleasant moment. See ya. What in the world do chemical engineers do? Make life-saving medicines accessible to everyone. Develop and deliver new energy sources safely and responsibly. Eliminate plastic waste from our oceans. When it comes to getting things done, chemical engineers have a pretty full to-do list. We do the math, science, and engineering to make medicine accessible, water drinkable, air breathable, the deep thinking to make the environment sustainable, systems affordable, safety reliable. We make discoveries scalable and the inconceivable feasible. So what in the world do chemical engineers do? We take things that have never been done and get them done for good. AICHE, doing a world of good. All right. All right. So thank you for inviting me. It's exciting to see so many students uh, on a Friday evening that are uh, willing to come learn a little bit about chemical engineering in the aerospace industry. I uh, want to start off by saying welcome to my home. I've been teleworking uh, from work for the last few months due to the pandemic, so we're still working from home right now. So it's the first time I've ever given a pre presentation inside my home. So there's some unique challenges. I don't get to see you guys face. I don't get to see the interaction and look at you. I don't have an audience. So I'm gonna do the best I can uh, with everything quiet and uh, we'll, we'll just keep going. So the idea here is to talk about uh, possible career paths for chemical engineers and provide examples of my own personal experiences, uh, specifically within the Johnson Space Center at Houston, Texas. So overall, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background, some of the organizational structures of the NASA Johnson Space Center, 
uh, I need to talk about you know uh, where I work and who I am, so you get an idea of where I'm coming from on these projects. And uh, due to the nature of the stream, I, I'm not sure if we'll be able to do a live Q&A or not. I, I'm guessing we will with questions here, uh, but I do have a, a broad ed category of frequently asked questions because I've been asked questions from students over the years and I put something together at the end as well. I think you'll find interesting. And, and of course, if there's any questions not answered, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, so this information is based on my own personal experience. Not every chemical engineer at NASA is going to have the same ideas that I do, but but I believe I've been very blessed uh, working the job that I am and, and I enjoy uh, where I work. Uh, some of the things I've got to do is, is battery testing, uh, cryogenic propulsion system, and I'm currently supporting in-situ resource utilization. If you don't know what that is, that's okay. I'm going to talk about it, and then we'll follow up with frequently asked questions. So a little bit about who I am uh, right now. That's a, a photo right before uh, COVID hit. I, I was clean shaven. Uh, my kids looked a little younger too. Uh, so I'm, I'm born and raised here in Houston, Texas. There's a, a misconception about Texans that, that we all ride horses and wear cowboy hats and we have thick accents. Well, we don't ride horses and wear cowboy hats, but, but you're gonna have to deal with my accent. So I, I come from a family of hard workers. I'm, I'm actually the first engineer in my family. I've got three boys uh, married uh, for almost 20 years, almost as long as I've been working now. Uh, youngest is in third grade. My oldest is actually a freshman in college. Uh, I've got a healthy mix of work and, and hobbies uh, from Boy Scouts. I'm actually going camping. As soon as this slide's over, I'm getting in the car. We're driving camping tonight. Uh, play guitar, do martial arts, uh, enjoy video games. I also serve in my church. Uh, I selected chemical engineering as a career, and I believe it was one of the best choices I ever made as a young man. It, it really set me down the uh, right path where I want to be right now. And I've been with NASA now almost 19 years. Um, I've, I've worked many different projects. I'm going to talk about a few of those. I can only talk about a handful. I've been there for, for like I said, 19 years, so I can't talk about them all. Uh, and I've played many different roles from, from supporting other engineers to uh, team lead to uh, doing component technology development, uh, some systems engineering, and uh, also project engineering. But it's never just one role. It's always multiple roles within each project. Uh, some of my schooling that, that I went through, my education, uh, in, in 10 of the slides, uh, really just to demonstrate it's what you make of your education, not where you completed it. Uh, th these schools are, are not the prestigious Ivy League schools. I'm, I'm not doing this to show off, right? I'm doing this just to show you, you know, I, I come from a humble background, uh, Alvin Community College. Uh, that was a junior college where I got my basics out of the way is affordable. I, I worked all, all throughout school uh, doing construction, sales jobs, uh, then transferred to University of Houston. I got a Bachelor of Science Chemical Engineering. Uh, I was also heavily involved in AICHE. I served as an officer. I attended a lot of different conferences. It was really fun to go to these conferences in person. So you guys are missing out a little bit. I'm glad y'all get to do something, but it's really good when you get to go and you get to network, you get to hang out with your friends and you get to meet other engineers that work in the field. So in the future, I hope you guys get more opportunities to actually travel and go to some of these. Uh, while I was at University of Houston, I served as a co-op and uh, I worked multiple uh, semesters uh, at Maxwell House in the food industry. I also worked at Bayer Corporation in the uh, uh, chemical industry, working particularly in plastics. I'm not really going to talk about those, but uh, it's interesting to have some other background as well besides aerospace. Uh, while I was going, uh, while I started work, I went to night school, got a master's in physics, and uh, Basically, I, I used training funds at, at work to get uh, my master's and uh, completed multiple science electives uh, as well, kind of making me uh, well-rounded, not, not all engineering, but some of the fun kind of science classes are that, that took like planetary geology, environment of Moon and Mars, and so forth. Uh, those are kind of things that make you good uh, specialists uh, to specialize within your field. 
So just to talk a little bit about the organizational structure of NASA. NASA is a very large organization and each center, uh, like I work at Johnson Space Center, it's like a small city. And there's going to be chemical engineers that work in other technical areas like and management also. And there's even a few chemical engineering astronauts that, that have worked at NASA. So I'm only, you know, once again, talking about my particular experiences. There's 10 uh, NASA field centers across the United States. Uh, there's also six communication telescope facilities and seven manufacturing test and research facilities. They're not shown on that image on the right there. And there's uh, all that's because all these facilities fall up under the leadership of the other of these major centers that you see on the screen. Uh, also, not all NASA facilities are within the continental United States, especially some of the telescopes. So my, my point of this is there's there's a lot of different possibilities for chemical engineers at, at NASA or even the aerospace industry. So within the Johnson Space Center, it's divided into directorates. And uh, I work in what's called the engineering directorate. Uh, once again, there, there may be other niche kind of opportunities to work in some of these other uh, directorates as a chemical engineer, but definitely engineering directorate is the, the best fit. Within the engineering directorate, we have divisions. Uh, that specialize in certain topics. For example, there's a crew and thermal division, aerospace and flight mechanics division. I work in what's called the propulsion and power division, and, and that's where I'll, I'll, I'll spend my time talking on these slides. Uh, the only other kind of logical fit for a chemical engineer may be crew and thermal. Obviously not robotics or structural engineering. That's, that's not where our strengths lie. Within the propulsion and power division, uh, there's different branches. So within a branch, the branch is where it's divided up into really small kind of groups. So we'll have maybe between 15 and 50 people in these uh, teams in these branches. Uh, I have spent, I started my career working in the energy systems test area. And I, I highly recommend if you ever have the opportunity to get the hands-on test experience, uh, you take it. Right, because it, it's going to help when you if you work in design, it's going to help you to make better designs, right? Because you had to work with your hands, right? You learn something that you're not going to learn in front of a computer screen. Uh, it, it'll help future managers appreciate uh, schedules and costs better. It'll help uh, senior engineers appreciate the hard work that, that test engineers have to do. A lot of times you're outdoors uh, and, and you're in the heat or you're in the cold. Uh, so, so it really makes you appreciate those things that, that uh, a lot of times new hires will be working. Uh, after uh, working in, in ESTA, I worked in propulsion systems, uh, and I'm going to talk about that later, so I won't talk about it too much here. And then right now, I'm, I'm supporting the energy conversion systems, which supports a, a wide range of things from pyrotechnics to electrical me mechanical actuators, uh, but we also work on fuel cells and what's known as in situ resource utilization uh, or propellant production on the moon or on Mars. Uh, so yeah, like I mentioned, I was supported each each branch within the propulsion uh, power division, and, and I'm going to start off talking uh, just in chronological order. Uh, I started my career working chemical storage, uh, in other words, batteries. Uh, I did this for roughly about six years in the test area, and uh, just to summarize up, batteries are chemical devices that produce energy. Uh, they're basically little mini chemical factories. And the uh, chemical engineering curriculum has a lot of synergies uh, with this technology branch. Uh, with, with energy, there's uh, you know thermodynamics and heat transfer, uh, chemistry, uh, physical, organic, and inorganic chemistry are all applicable to batteries. The engineering role that I played was to design batteries uh, that are resistant to thermal runaway and meet voltage and cap uh, capacity requirements for whatever system they're going in. And uh, we did this mostly by testing performance and safety characteristics. That was my particular role. And I did this, uh, you know, roughly about 15 years ago. A lot of things have changed, uh, but uh, at the same time, it still gives you an idea of, of what's involved in this because it's very high level uh, that I'm going to cover. 
So we test batteries uh, for uh, a number of reasons, but primarily because battery manufacturers do not expose their batteries to the situation that NASA regularly uh, puts them in place in, uh, in, in areas that a battery is not made to, to operate that you buy off the shelf. Uh, so uh, NASA does need multiple batteries uh, throughout uh, all different types of projects on the International Space Station, on the Space Chute, also known as the uh, Extravehicular Mobility Unit, that's what that EMU is, uh, shuttle or the Space Loss System. Uh, it, it, just to briefly summarize batteries, they're all toxic to some degree, especially if they're leaking. High energy batteries can cause a, a lethal electric shock. High temperatures can be generated at causing a touching hazard. Uh, fire due to a flammable electrolyte uh, can cause collateral, collateral damage. And, uh, and, and then you think in these enclosed spaces that we're in on station or on a vehicle, can cause a toxic atmosphere, which could be catastrophic. And uh, and a leak in, in zero G, right? You wouldn't think nothing of a little battery leak, but in zero G, it can get in your eye, cause blindness, health problems, uh, even death. So the, uh, the scenarios, it, it, we have to treat batteries uh, very carefully and, you know, this type of testing to make sure they're safe for space flight use is summed up into performance testing, flight testing, and abuse testing. And we we test all different types of batteries from lithium ion, nickel metal hydrides, to standard alkaline batteries, or even lead acid batteries, uh, doing long and short term uh, cycling to, to measure their performance. Uh, uh, determining their optimal charge and discharge rates, uh, how safe they are to use, how long we can use them, uh, measuring their capacities uh, in different thermal environments. So if they're operating in direct sunlight, they can get extremely hot, for example. Also, just determining what their vacuum tolerance is. When we put them in a vacuum, do they start to leak? Now, flight testing is a little different. It's kind of like uh, performance testing, but at the same time, you have another level of quality control that's involved uh, just to be able to make sure that everything we've done is done uh, by the book and can be repeated. And, uh, you know, this supports all different types of projects. I mean, we have on station laptops, uh, handheld electronics, uh, barcode readers. Uh, the picture there on the right is one of the astronauts holding up an electronic device that I actually tested for him. So it was a personal electronic device. I thought it was really cool that he sent a picture uh, to the team for us because we spent a lot of long hours getting this rust through so he'd have it and um, uh, basically be comfortable on station while he's there for long duration. Uh, picture in the lower right hand corner is just kind of a standard uh, thermal test. Uh, numerous batteries are inside a thermal chamber and uh, they'll go through different cycling uh, as you're charging and discharging them in a thermal environment. So basically how they operate in the environment they're going to be exposed to. Abuse testing is something a little different. Uh, basically we determine the safety characteristics of batteries. Everything that the warning level is telling you not to do, that's what we do, right? We overcharge them, over discharge them, short circuit them. Uh, we put them in fires and see how they uh, perform in a fire. Uh, drop them, crush them, vibrate them, uh, then even vent and burst them. Uh, now these slides are a little old, but or this video is a little old, but I have a video to share of some of the testing uh, that uh, we've done, some of this abuse testing. Each test is unique. Uh, this first one is a drop test. Simulates an accidental drop. You can determine from zero to eight foot uh, trap doors operated by a solenoid. Uh, temperatures measured before handling it. Uh, this next test in, in the little clip, I, I'm noticing there's a little lag, so I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to wait for it to catch up. So in, the, in, in this next one, it's called a heat to vent test. It's basically demonstrating what happens if a battery gets in a fire. Uh, this next one is a crush test. It simulates an internal short. So if there was a manufacturer's defect, uh, and then on a, in a launch environment, the, the battery is shaking and vibrating. So if there was a little metal shaving that worked its way loose 
and then found its way between the electrode and cathode and uh, it would cause a short circuit and you could potentially, you can see the energy that's released in these batteries. Now, nobody's really surprised about lithium ion batteries catching on fire now, but back 15 years ago, before all the laptop batteries kind of came and, and everybody started to know about these, we, had, we were already aware and uh, working with industry to help add some kind of safety devices as well to, to make a battery safer to operate. Next big category to talk about is chemical propulsion. Uh, short definition of propulsion is it, it involves controlling combustion of a fuel and oxidizer at, velo at high velocities through a nozzle. And there's many different types of uh, propulsion, including nuclear, electric, uh, plasma. Uh, I, of course, uh, as a chemical engineer, I'm going to be uh, focused on, on chemical propulsion. And while the chemical engineering curriculum, it, you know, unit operations won't be so useful as far as your distillation columns. Uh, definitely, uh, a chemi is very good for propulsion related field. Uh, with energy, you've got thermodynamics, heat transfer, there's fluid mechanics and mass transfer phenomena. Uh, chemistry and chemical reaction, of course, with combustion. Uh, process controls, being system and subsystem interaction. Uh, just the engine doesn't react alone. There's tanks and control valves. And I mean, the, the entire system has to work together flawlessly. Uh, and then when there are problems, analyzing the data, solving failures, uh, just general kind of critical thinking skills is all beneficial that you get from being a chemical engineer. Uh, now, there's multiple types of chemical propulsion, including like hypergolic propulsion, uh, which is kind of the traditional toxic propulsion where you don't need uh, uh, an igniter. Uh, you mix the chemicals and they catch on fire. I'm focusing on what uh, they call green propulsion or cryogenic propulsion. In specific, uh, liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Uh, so uh, cryogen is just a, a liquid at room temperature. So uh, to, to, to get uh, liquid oxygen and liquid methane at room temperature into a liquid, you have to get it extremely cold. And there's uh, many reasons why you would want to do this. Uh, a liquid oxygen, liquid methane system, for example, would allow you to use uh, propellants that are produced on the moon or on Mars. Uh, so you could send a chemical plant before you send a mission to Mars and you could have you know all of your methane and oxygen for the ride home already made so you could essentially send a much smaller rocket and save uh, a lot of mass that you would have to lift off and and get to mars um, they also offer a higher vehicle performance now I, I put a little star there because there's always a disclaimer when it comes to propulsion there's pros and cons of, of liquid oxygen liquid methane uh, just like there are with toxic propellants and storable propellants um, so there's definitely a situation in trade studies that need to be performed for different things. Uh, a liquid oxygen, liquid methane definitely is a strong candidate for a descent engine to Mars. Uh, there's also, of course, they provide com commonality with breathable oxygen and uh, fuel cell reactant storage as well. So uh, using, uh, you could use liquid oxygen, liquid methane or liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen on the moon uh, for fuel cell as well. Uh, using these non-toxic pro propellants is also beneficial for the astronauts in the landing environment uh, because some of that uh, spent fuel, not all of it gets burned. There can be toxic in that landing area. Uh, cost of hypergolic propellants is also pretty expensive to test, uh, whereas liquid oxygen is, is, is dirt cheap in comparison. Uh, liquid methane is, is very cheap here in Texas as well. Uh, so acceptance of this type of, of method of propulsion was continually plagued by a lack of flight heritage and experience though so we weren't using it uh, really in, in my early career I was, I was very fortunate to be able to be involved in a lot of this as we developed these programs and I'm going to talk about some of that technology development coming up uh, but a big thing was people were concerned about its ignition and, and how to ignite it. So we went through many different tests proven that it could be ignited reliably. Uh, so some of these projects, this technology developments been over the last uh, you know, decade, 
uh, on many different projects, including cryogenic fluid management. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Armadillo Aerospace uh, was was a partner that we teamed up with to build a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. Uh, I'll talk some about that as well. Uh, a White Sands test facility, the WSTF, that's a test facility that uh, supports us. We do some altitude testing, also Stennis Space Systems Center engine testing, and then this uh, vehicle we call Morpheus that we developed in-house. Uh, uh, vertical takeoff and landing test stand. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of projects I've got to work on throughout the years. Uh, like some, some other really interesting example I'm not going to talk on is, is like in the upper right hand corner gas cart. This is an oxygen methane uh, test stand. So this would allow you to operate an engine uh, uh, like basically a pencil thruster in, in gas phase. Uh, for, for cryogenic propulsion, we really want liquid all the way up to the injector um, because once you start getting two-phase flow, things get more complicated. There's more instabilities. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later also. Uh, on the bottom is uh, our Orbital Maneuvering System Engine, OMS-E. Uh, that's actually a shuttle heritage engine um, that is being vibration tested. Uh, not necessarily a, a chemical engineering thing, but uh, what we were doing was the fluids testing after we vibrate to make sure there was no leaks. So a lot of, uh, you know, using uh, tools to detect leaks. Uh, so check, you know, a baseline uh, vibrate afterwards, uh, test for leaks. So. So this next slide is uh, just kind of an overview of cryogenic fluid management. Uh, cryogenics is, is the science of ultra low temperatures. And it, you know, we in particular, uh, we're studying how to, to store, transfer, and handle cryogens on, on Earth, in space, and on lunar surfaces. Uh, this involves developing analytical tools and thermal models to predict performance, and then also designing and testing to actually store and distribute the uh, cryogens uh, for long duration missions. Uh, my role on CFM, I was actually the project manager at JSC. Uh, there, was, there was multiple project managers across different centers. I'm, I'm in particular talking about my role. So, you know, as a chemical engineer, you have to do uh, not all engineering, right? There's technical oversight, task management, budget plans, procurements, personnel management, forecasting, scheduling. Uh, in this particular project, our goal was to take components of a system and increase their technology readiness level up to what we call a TRL-6. Uh, that's defined as testing these components on an integrated system in a relevant space environment. So we developed uh, what was called an attitude control system test stand and placed it in a 15-foot thermal vacuum chamber. So this is a simplified uh, attitude control system uh, piping and instrument diagram. So this particular test stand was fabricated to simulate the Orion service module ACS. So the curvature that you see on the upper in, in, on the on the PNID actually matches one of the propellant tanks on the vehicle. And I, I've got a, a in the next slide an actual picture of the test stand. So the goal here is to deliver cryogenic fuel or oxidizer to the RCS engine. RCS stands for Reaction Control System Engine. These are the small thrusters that allow the vehicle to, to turn versus the main thruster that pushes. We have thrusters also that turn. So uh, a TDS is a thermodynamic vent system. That's what we call. So we have basically propellant that comes from the run tank and it's in that red line or orange line that leads to the thruster. And as it's going through this line, it's slowly getting warmer and warmer. We have a thermodynamic uh, valve that will open and it's, it's uh, the, the orifice is sized such that it allows the minimum amount of flow to come out. So we sacrifice a little bit of propellant in order to subcool uh, our, our, the liquid coming up to the valve. So as a vapor expands, you know, you release the heat, so it's getting colder. So we, we release that uh, propellant, 
line gets colder, and then you have basically a counter flow uh, heat exchanger uh, going on uh, in our feed lines that lead up to the, the, the thruster. Uh, and the reason why you want to have liquid up to the thruster, you really don't want two-phase flow going through your thrusters. It just causes, uh, it can cause problems. There's many different components in this system. All right, so this is where I'm talking about systems engineering versus a component, right? To, to be able to develop a component, you have to have a system to place it in and test it in. So you can't really just test a, a component all by itself. Uh, you, you're never really going to be able to trust it until you put it in the system and watch how it performs in your system. So that's the point of this test stand. Uh, there's a, a you know 62 gallon run tank. There's a, a 19 inch spherical COPV. That's a composite uh, overwrap pressure vessel. It allows very. It's basically a really lightweight, uh, high pressure tank that you can put helium in, uh, which acts as a pressure for your system. There's a thruster injector assembly. Uh, uh, that we, we also added some piezoelectric valves into this test stand and we were testing the concept of, of that uh, technology as well. So piezoelectric is actually a shape changing ceramic uh, that allows you to apply a voltage and the, the ceramic will actually change shape uh, based on the voltage you put in. It's high voltage, but it's very, very low current. So because it's high voltage and low current, it's very low power. That means we're not putting any uh, heat into our cryogen by operating our valves. So a lot of traditional valves, like a solenoid valve, uh, you open it, it gets very hot with that electrical energy, and then that heat soaks back into your system, and now you're heating up your propellant, and then you have to drive off more uh, propellant to keep it cold in your thermodynamic vent system. So it's a lot of little things to think about in the entire system, uh, but you know we were able to study these particular valves in the system and increase their, their TRL up as well. Uh, we also did some things like studying uh, different types of multi-layer insulation. Uh, that's a type of insulation that uh, wraps around and it, it operates in a vacuum. It's made for operating in a vacuum. And we were able with this system to demonstrate long-term steady state conditioning uh, with our thermodynamic bit system inside a hard vacuum. So this is a uh, just a few pictures of, of each of those components in the system and, and how it's assembled uh, compared to the, the PNID. Uh, with this system, we, we made advances in thermal, uh, you know, able to decrease our heat leak into the system using high performance MLI, thermal standoffs, different types of straps. Uh, we also tested high pressure cold helium storage, uh, ground loading and storage techniques. I, I'm going to bring that up again on, on the next uh, project I talk about uh, with Morpheus. Uh, I talked about uh, valves, different types of valve technologies. Uh, also looked at magnetically actuated high pressure helium valves. Um, and, and all of these testing was used for, for what we call the Morpheus vehicle design operation. Like this is kind of gathering data, making us smarter for some of the things that we were going to do later with cryos. Uh, each one of these components is its own project. I mean, I could talk about any one of those components and spend a whole presentation just talking about, you know, the data and what we designed and how we did. But I really want to keep this upper level and show a lot of different things. Um, you know, just like like the high pressure, the, the helium sum, summary, right? We had a uh, LM2 spray bar uh, that we were actually using liquid nitrogen to chill down the helium uh, before it went, uh, before we used it to pressurize our liquid nitrogen tank. So you're not dumping hot gas into a cold tank. And, and you might not think it's very cold, but you got to consider, you know, uh, liquid oxygen might be roughly around negative 300 Fahrenheit. And then you're putting something at room temperature. Uh, it's significantly hotter. So uh, all of this kind of made us smarter. I got a little video here to show. This is a 62 gallon run tank. Uh, Basically, all, all I did was open a two inch isolation valve and we were testing the isolation valve. We were making sure it didn't leak and we had all the contents dumping out the side of the building. So what you saw on the previous slide was inside the vacuum chamber. We have a, a, a line that goes out the vacuum chamber outside the site. And this is just uh, 60 gallons. 
that opened up uh, as soon as the uh, isolation valve opens, you can kind of get an idea of the flow rates that are going to these engines. And that's it, that was 60 gallons. So it, it, uh, it with a two inch valve. Uh, with, with nitrogen, you've got a, about a one to 700 expansion ratio, right? So it's liquid inside the tank and then it expands into vapor. So that was, you know, 62 gallons of liquid nitrogen. One of our early partners was called Armadillo Aerospace. They, uh, they were really good at rapid prototyping and testing. And then we had uh, a lot of experience with liquid oxygen, liquid methane. So we teamed up and they built this little horizontal test sled. Uh, you know, they, they developed a vertical takeoff landing modular vehicle, uh, tested it uh, numerous different uh, tests. And this is, you know, like I said, it's, it's one slide that's covering, uh, you know, over a year of work. Um, with this, we did the first liquid oxygen, liquid methane hot fire of a dual bell nozzle during an altitude sweep. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, first liquid oxygen, liquid methane pyrotechnic ignition. So uh, there was a big concern about how to ignite liquid oxygen, liquid methane. So we basically said, okay, we can make a backup system and put a pyrotechnic uh, on an engine uh, that will, you know, you push the button, it's going to light and fire kind of uh, and create a flame and you will definitely light your ignition. So we proved that's possible. Uh, also first self-pressurized throttling uh, uh, liquid oxygen, liquid methane lander. So throttling is the key word there. So you're using control valves to be able to increase or decrease your thrust to uh, raise, lower the vehicle, and then having a gimbling system to be able to change the nozzle and point which direction you wanna go. Uh, after some of this testing, and some of it was done in parallel, we were doing altitude testing. When I say altitude testing, it's basically very low pressure. So we have a we place this into a giant vacuum chamber, decrease the uh, the, the the pressure to the equivalent of you know thirty thousand or up to like seventy thousand, up to a hundred thousand feet. So you basically what your engine's going to behave at, in that low uh, pressure environment. It, it, it acts completely different than how it'll act at sea level. So on this particular slide, one of my project was to design a nozzle. I know that's not very chemical engineering, but you have to sometimes just learn as you go and, and you, you've got to push your boundaries of what you're comfortable with. So I designed this nozzle uh, to, to be able to operate with either uh, what's called a rail optimized nozzle or a dual bell nozzle. So I made the first sections which has the same contour to operate at sea level. It has a flanged interface and then uh, I could change out either of these by changing out the bolt configuration so uh, that's that's how it looked like on the test stand and on the test lab there this is what it looked like inside white sands uh, test facility altitude chamber so what we did here was uh, reduce the pressure uh, to simulate that high altitude and and then uh, what's interesting is you're in a, a, a contained volume, so as you fire the engine, you actually are slightly increasing the pressure in the environment. So one of the things about the dual bell is it's operated to, it, it works at either sea level or it works uh, at, at high uh, uh, altitude. So I, I, if you look at uh, at sea level, it's got a seven to one area expansion ratio, and you look at high altitude, it's got a 46 to one area expansion ratio. If you notice a lot of the pictures of, of engines they show on the news, they always show the nozzle. It's actually not the engine, uh, it's only a part of the engine, but that big expansion ratio is, is what gives you the thrust at high altitude. If you fire that same engine at sea level with that same big air expansion nozzle, you'll get uh, over expansion, under expansion uh, phenomenon as you're firing and basically a reduced efficiency. So one of these things was, was uh, this test was kind of to see how that performed, uh, how, how that performance uh, worked uh, during testing. So I'll just play the video here. Uh, and of course, the, the chemical engineering skills that are required for some of this, you know, fluid mechanics uh, for the throat and the geometry. Uh, notice that blue flame, that's liquid oxygen, liquid methane uh, when it's firing. 
So that's the sea level test. You can see how it's not using all of the uh, the nozzle, but at high altitude, it's using the entire nozzle. So it was actually doing what it was supposed to. Towards the end of the test, you can see the nozzle is kind of slowly uh, closing in on itself. That's the pressure in the chamber actually increasing. Uh, other skills, of course, you know, mathematics, always useful, critical thinking, uh, uh, operation system, failure analysis, uh, thermal is, is very useful for fuel film cooling of the main engine. Uh, some other testing that uh, was done, and all of this is kind of leading up to uh, a, some vehicle testing I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, Project Morpheus, you'll use fuel film cooling of, of the main engine, and uh, we wanted to test a regeneratively cooled engine. So uh, my part of this project was actually to develop that thrust stand that you see on the right-hand corner. Uh, to be able to measure thrust, uh, we're using load cells in there uh, to build up the test stand and the fluids that interface with the system facility fluids and the engine fluids. So that was uh, that was my kind of part. And the video I'm about to show here is it shows you why uh, we test. So uh, one thing I want to point out is that I didn't do all of this. So, so right there at the end, you can see we had a catastrophic failure of the engine. And that is why we do engine testing on the ground before it ever gets on the vehicle. Uh, eventually, we were able to make corrections and, and get on the right track. Uh, but there's always little hiccups like that. And you just you can't give up. You just got to get back to the drawing board, uh, do a little bit of designing, a little bit of testing, go back, do a little bit more designing and modeling and testing, uh, make that circular loop until you get to a point where you feel comfortable actually flying these. Um, and, and I was mentioning that, you know, uh, I didn't work all of this solo, right? Some of these things are definitely like mechanical engineering, right? So I'm working on a team uh, for developing some of the, you know, the load cell thrust measurement, for example, while I'm working the fluid side of this. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a team effort. So uh, this next project I want to talk about that, that falls under the chemical propulsion was building a vertical test stop and landing vehicle test stand. And uh, some of the overall accomplishments, that, and, and there were many, just to talk about a few, though, is, is plume effects uh, when you're landing in a dusty environment, which is on Mars or Moon. That layer of regolith is very fine and, and uh, when you're landing, it throws it up. And I do have a video that shows that. Uh, one of the things that we tested on this vehicle was an automated landing and hazard avoidance technology. Uh, basically, this allows your vehicle to land as a robot without a pilot. It uh, scans the ground and uh, feeds back information and makes choices on where the, the safest landing spot is. So since we had a vehicle we could actually test, we were actually able to test this in a real uh, environment. Once again, increasing that TRL level. Uh, we also tested different components like the the p0 electric valves that we tested on the uh on the cfm test stand i was able to get these and put and test them on the morpheus vehicle as well uh so that really uh tests your vibration environment uh you know as you fire there's a lot of vibration that gets throughout all your vehicles so it's something you have to take into consideration uh for for any component that you put on the system uh, we also, uh, various COTS equipment, COTS is a commercial off the shelf. So a lot of these things we just bought right off the shelf and assembled them into a vehicle. Uh, we optimized uh, ground loading techniques uh, such as cold helium, uh, composite overwrap, pressure vessel, pre-chill and pressure fed for, for pressure fed engines. Um, my role on this project was the ground support equipment lead. Uh, so I was responsible for maintaining the all of the pressure systems uh, for ground support equipment uh, prior to putting it on the vehicle. Um, 
that there's there, there's not a lot of glamour compared to designing the engine, right? But this is something that's a behind the scenes job uh, where you get a lot of hands-on experience. I was actually loading the cryogenic propellants onto the vehicle. I was loading the, you know, the liquid oxygen, liquid methane, handling all the systems, the high pressure helium systems, and able to get the test uh, stand ready to do the hot fire and do all the post-test processing after it landed as well. And through the years, I did you know about uh, almost 50 you know tests between tether testing, hot fire testing, free flight testing at, at both Johnson Space Center and Kennedy Space Center, and and I'm happy to say that there were never any test delays due to any of my pressure systems or ground support equipment, right? But we had you know uh, uh, toolboxes and just full of spare parts because there were always something that needed to be replaced. There was always some little surprise on every single test day, and it was never the same thing twice there's always something to keep you thinking and you have to always be ready to to make a a, a, a surprise you always get a lot of surprises so this next little video i have is actually uh, on a crane in houston texas uh, at the johnson space center one thing to know about johnson space center is it's a very residential area so we weren't able to do any free flight testing at jsc so we had to do it with you know tethered to a crane and um, so this particular test, we put a bunch of simulant, uh, soil simulant from, from Mars on the ground. And as we do this hot fire, just keep in mind, this is what astronauts would see as they're landing on the surface of a planetary object. Uh, the picture in picture is actually a thermal camera that shows the, the different temperatures that has the plant. A lot of these videos are available online as well. If you search up Morpheus, uh, you, you'll see quite a few different videos on Morpheus. I just picked a couple uh, that I really liked that I was also there while we were testing. Uh, this is actually a free flight test that was performed at Kennedy Space Center. Um, at Kennedy, they're, they're actually on an airport. So we had, uh, we, we could actually test uh, without the- Ignition in five, four, three, two, one. Problem.
ground target. Good shut down. Test complete. So I, I was actually there for that test. I was actually uh, uh, pretty close. You know, for safety, we got to stay one mile back. But being able to be right there during the test, it's very exciting. The last topic I want to talk about is what's called in situ resource utilization. This is the collection, processing, storing, and use of materials found and manufactured on other astronomical objects that replace the materials brought from Earth. Basically, it's how to live off the land. It's it's sending it's it's building a chemical plant on on, on Moon. It's building a chemical plant on Mars to be able to take advantage of the resources that are that are there in place. Uh, to be able to save weight, to be able to have a permanent presence, right? If we went back to the moon now without these technologies, we would basically be planting a flag and coming back home versus uh, being able to live off the land, stay there, and have a permanent presence. Um, you know, chemical engineering definitely synergizes in this field. This is actually the field that I'm working in right now, and uh, some of the project, I'm going to talk about one of the projects that I'm working on. Uh, obviously, you know, chemical reactions are used for, for a lot of these different processes. Uh, there's a lot of process control and system design uh, that's critical for chemical plants. Uh, there's also a lot of heat and mass transfer problems. And, and what's really exciting is we've, we've found water on both the Moon and Mars. It's been, uh, it, uh, it's been confirmed. Uh, so that's what I really like this picture. It's on the slide. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's footprint on the moon and, and some artists actually added to Mars. So we're, we're, we plan on using the moon as a stepping stone to getting to Mars with, with the technologies that we can develop on the moon and have uh, quick communication. You know, you have a three second telemetry from, from talking on Earth to getting that signal to the moon versus on Mars, you have about 15 minutes. It's significantly farther. Uh, and that's traveling, you know, speed of light. So uh, we'll be able to learn a lot by going back to the moon. It's it, a lot of scientists definitely agree on that. And now we've actually found uh, recently within this administration a uh, a landing spot. Uh, we're picking a, a pole, polar region for the landing. Uh, part of that is from a lot of analyzing a lot of data. Uh, a lot of scientists working on this through many years. Uh, you know, Luna 24 with a Soviet sample return mission, uh, they showed about 0.1% water by mass and, and some of that. Uh, Clementine uh, was a, a joint ballistic missile defense and, and NASA mission. Uh, they confirmed water ice at the poles based on, on uh, uh, radar. Uh, Lunar Prospector uh, was a NASA mission, uh, detected hydrogen using a neutron spectrometer, about 300 million metric tons of water ice. And then um, the next one was the Indian Space Center Research Organization, uh, estimated about 600 metric tons in the same general area. Uh, so we don't exactly know the, the total amount, but we definitely know there's enough up there to be able to take uh, and, and use uh, for a, a mission. Uh, in 2009, there was the Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter and also the uh, Lunar Crater Observation Sensing Satellite. Uh, this slammed into the uh, upper stage, uh, into uh, one of the craters in the polar region, and you could actually see uh, and measure uh, a water content that came off in the, the ejecta plume. And it's roughly, you know, 5.6 percent by mass water that they found in that one particular crater. So definitely water on the moon. <clears throat> so with that water, uh, through water electrolysis, you can you can convert it into hydrogen and oxygen uh, using electric current, uh, either from solar panels or some other power source, maybe nuclear. Uh, that oxygen gas can be used for breathing. Oxygen and hydrogen also can be used to run a fuel cell. And of course, uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen can be used uh, as rocket propellant. Um, now, there's multiple ways that you can process lunar soil to be able to uh, take the water content out. 
uh, you know, carbothermals, oxygen, molten re uh, regular electrolysis reactor. Uh, and by the way, chemical engineers fit into a lot of these different topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about auger dryer because that happens to be what I'm working on right now. That's what's in that right hand corner. Uh, that's actually a clear casing that's shown right now. So you can see inside and we can look at some of the mechanical effects, some of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, I do have a quick little video that to, to show about some of those capabilities. Um, uh, th this uh, particular test stand would operate under the triple point. So the concept of operation is you have icy regolith that's dumped into a hopper, uh, large rocks are removed, uh, the, that regolith is heated uh, to a sublimation temperature. Sublimation is when, uh, if you look at the, the water vapor curve on the right, it's when you're going directly from a solid ice directly to a vapor just by increasing temperature. So it's just moving across the line here to the right. Uh, uh, so the triple point, you can see that it's marked here in this little black solid liquid vapor. If we can operate under the triple point, it actually uh, it makes the system less complex. It's, it's more complex in a thermal standpoint, but it's less complex in an operational standpoint because you don't have any liquid water that can kind of act as mud inside this uh, auger as the auger is turning. Uh, uh, deposition of water vapor, that's basically uh, desublimation. It's when the water vapor turns back into ice. That would occur in a downstream system into an accumulator tank. Uh, we would just discharge the warm regolith and then the, the water ice would be transported to a crater ridge for processing. Uh, in other words, it could go through electrolysis. Uh, some of the near term it, uh, goals were leveraging existing hardware to gain physical thermal data and then model some of that with actual test data. And then we want to uh, place this in a thermal vacuum chamber similar to that CFM test stand where we're operating a whole system inside a vacuum chamber uh, to prove the concepts that, uh, that will work on the moon, to, to prove the system can work on the moon. So this is a little video that just shows the uh, capabilities of a breadboard test stand that we have. So this is a lunar auger dryer ISRU project. It's a screw conveyor dryer. So the stainless steel casing would be used for thermal testing, uh, plastic for mechanical testing. It allows us to, to look for plugs. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is operate without valves. Uh, so by manipulating the geometry of the flights inside the auger, I can actually uh, create a plug on the inlet and exit. And uh, if I can get that plug into steady state, that's one of the things that we're testing right now. Uh, we won't have to use valves, uh, and, and valves are very heavy, uh, they add complexity, um, and we'll, we'll be able to operate under the triple point, so uh, very low pressures inside the test stand as well. Uh, you can see right there the plug forming, uh, so you can imagine heaters on the outside heating that soil up, driving off the water, and then that water goes to the path of least resistance, there's actually an exit discharge tubing. Uh, this this is just looking at some of the plug flow. Uh, here is actually looking at the exit. Uh, the soil is discharged onto a load cell and we can get an accurate uh, mass flow rate uh, going through the system. Uh, fully instrumented, have thermocouples to measure a thermal gradient across the system. These are actually internal thermocouples. Um, and we can move the heaters, uh, which are resistant band heaters, into multiple configurations uh, for short or long configuration. Uh, to, to work on you know water extraction energy efficiency uh, this is a picture of it with the the insulation uh, this is a stainless steel casing with the insulation on uh, right now we're in the process of doing uh, DEM uh, modeling which is physics based modeling and also using thermal desktop uh, which is a thermal modeling of the test stand And then that's the uh, the 15 foot vacuum chamber. 
So we're in the process. That's actually an ongoing project that I'm currently supporting and still working on right now. Uh, this next fiscal year, I hope to get through some initial thermal testing and driving off water in a laboratory uh, using a uh, lunar simulant. Uh, as I mentioned, Moon is a stepping stone to Mars, and the, the picture on the right-hand side is an enhanced color cross-section of uh, Martian underground ice. There's definitely uh, water on Mars as well. Uh, what's interesting with Mars is you can make liquid methane because Mars has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Uh, so with the uh, Sabatier reaction, which is a common reaction, uh, popular in chemical engineering, I'm sure it's in you, know, you guys' uh, textbooks, uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen uh, with a catalyst is going to leave methane and water and release energy. So it's exothermic. So it's actually a self-sustaining reaction as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of these, this, this particular size would be sized for a, a Mars sample return mission. And uh, uh, it's just a regeneratively cooled uh, single pass pack bag reactor. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have questions on a lot of this. Uh, this is a project that I supported a long time ago, um, and, and we're currently uh, not going to the Mars just yet. We're going to moon first, uh, so this will be on the, the to-do list in the near future. Uh, but it's something we have looked at in the past, and it's definitely a feasible concept. It just needs to be optimized. So that, that kind of concludes all the projects I want to talk about. That was roughly one hour, uh, I, I think, on, on time. I think we're still looking pretty good. Uh, there's some, some frequently asked questions that I've had throughout the years. I've gotten questions from different uh, students. So I thought I would just share some of that information uh, with you guys. Uh, you know, it, uh, you know, advice specific to students. Uh, one thing I always tell everybody is to apply for an internship or a co-op as soon as possible. The, the work experience that you gain is going to make you competitive for any entry level engineering position. And even if it takes you longer to graduate, and even if you get a little lower grade because you couldn't study as much, it's still worth it because that work experience, it, you know, it makes you more competitive. Uh, than someone that hasn't ever worked in the field and, and they're trying to get that entry level position. Uh, also, uh, it's going to help you determine if this is a career path that fits your personality. So, for example, when I co-opted, I worked in the food industry and also worked in the chemical industry. So I knew before I worked, you know, that, yeah, this was great, but hopefully, you know, I can find a job somewhere else also at a different company, you know, specifically within the aerospace industry. Also, another tip is uh, apply to many different companies. Uh, you know, you call it uh, law of averages, right? That's a sales term. You know, it, it's, it, it just uh, apply to everybody. You know, of course, if you definitely don't want to work to them, don't don't waste their time. But it's good to have a backup plan. So so and, and even and also if you get an offer or two different offers, you can use one of them as a, as a bargaining for a sign on bonus with the other offer. Uh, so it gives you options. So definitely apply to a lot of different places when you are out searching for jobs. Um, and, and also, I kind of mentioned this earlier, consider working in some kind of test area or an operational position in your earlier career that's going to give you that hands-on experience. You know, it, it just helps, you know, uh, it helps you in so many different ways. When you're designing something to know that you have to actually operate it also, it makes you make the, the design a little better. And, and also don't expect to stop learning after college. Um, you know, I do a lot of things that my formal education never really trained me for. Just I kept learning. I took the on the job training. I took different training classes, those kind of things. Just keep moving, keep going forward. Uh, look for opportunities. Uh, right now, also get involved in professional organizations. AICHE is a great one, but also, you know, don't just be a member. See if you can serve as an officer, all right? That active membership will make your resume stand out. But, but even more important than that, it's developing contacts and friendships, right? That, that can last a whole lifetime. I still know some of the guys I went to college with, right? Because we worked so hard to get through that system. I know what you guys are going through right now. Uh, you know, networking and conferences, that kind of thing. You can you can talk to different companies, you know, find out what they're working on and, and if that's something you want to be working on. 
Uh, also really good is take communication courses and look for opportunities to give presentations. Right? Take a technical writing class. Believe it or not, you're going to be writing a lot of reports. You'll be writing proposals. You'll be writing evaluations of contractors. Uh, you'll be writing you know, research and development papers. Uh, if you don't have that technical writing skill, uh, you're, 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 you're not going to stand out or you might stand out in a bad way. Uh, so I, I do recommend that. That's a very good tool for communicating. Also, you know, public speaking is a great way to, to advance in your career and stand out among your peers. You know, when, when I was in college, I wasn't the smartest engineer on the, the design team, but I was on the best design team because I, I was the guy that was willing to present and go out in front of everybody. So they wanted me on the team. So that's something else to think about. Uh, also, you know, consider taking some type of systems engineering project management courses. As you can see on the things that I worked on uh, throughout my career, it wasn't always just chemical engineering uh, curriculum, right? There's a lot of different things, system interactions that are important. You know, system engineering is an interdisciplinary field uh, that's, that's designing, integrating, managing complex systems over a whole life cycle. Uh, project management is you know leading a team uh, to get the work done All right so it takes a, a different kind of personality uh, sometimes for some of these jobs but take some of the classes see if it's for you because right? that's another way to help you advance in your career um, I've been asked, you know, what are the educational qualifications to work? Uh, typically, just a bachelor's degree uh, is what it takes for an entry level position. Uh, science based electives also help you help make you well rounded, at least in the aerospace industry. Um, some more questions I've gotten. Do you recommend advanced degree uh, or just a, a bachelor's degree? And, and I really just say that depends. Uh, having a, a PhD or doctorate, it's going to increase your knowledge, but it really doesn't increase your intelligence, right? It, you're still just as smart as you were before, but now you just know a little bit more things. So does that help you with a specialty in your field? If it does, and that's something you really love, then go for it. Another way to compare it is, is you know, comparing salaries with and without the advanced degree. If you stay in school for four more years, it means you're not getting paid for four years and you're not advancing in the, your career at that job for four years. Uh, also, in that early career, you can make investments, uh, stock market, real estate, whatever the case may be, you know, with the money that you're getting paid versus paying tuition, you're not making anything. Uh, but, you know, I don't recommend that you go back to school for money or not for money. Only really go back to school if you want to do that, that PhD, if you love learning or, or you want to go for a specialty and that's really something that you want. And even then, I consider taking night classes and you can still work and take night classes. It drives it out, makes it last longer. But then you're at least getting paid and a lot of companies will actually pay you uh, to to take those advanced classes as long as it benefits them. And they'll typically make you sign a contract as well uh, that you'll work for them for a number of years after. So that even then, that's kind of job security for you as well. And, and you're always going to continue to learn on the job. Uh, so uh, whether you have a PhD or not, you're still going to have to learn new things. You're never going to have all the skills for everything determined in your school. Uh, what are your responsibilities as a chemical engineer? I think I answered a lot of that in, in the, these slides, but it's important to know there's a lot of crossover between uh, disciplines, you know, in, in mechanical, aerospace, or electrical engineer. Uh, it's important to have a network. So when you don't know the answer, go find somebody that does. And I was asked, you know, why I chose chemical engineering if I love space exploration. Uh, basically, uh, always have a backup plan. I knew at worst case, if I chose chemical engineering, I, you know, I live in Houston. There's a ton of chemical plants. There's a big petrochemical industry all around us. Uh, my worst case backup plan had a really nice silver lining and that, that those are actually really well paying jobs as well. So, uh, so, so that was, you know, my thought process I do what I like and, and I have a backup plan as well. Uh, what are some other things I would have studied if it wasn't chemical engineering? Uh, you know, I did. I do have a physics degree as well, uh, but really theoretical physics. There's very few job opportunities, you know, just being realistic. Uh, the, the, a lot of it's in teaching, um, you know, few they're competitive that, that there are. They're very competitive and they're typically not always hands on. And I really enjoy the hands on uh, working with my hands and designing and testing uh, that kind of environment. 
Uh, I don't recommend civil petroleum aerospace degrees just because they limit opportunities. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those degrees. Please don't get me wrong on that. They're excellent. But if you want to change and all industries have ups and downs, if you have a versatile degree uh, like chemical uh, engineering or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, uh, those can typically go from one field to the other a lot easier than, say, a petroleum engineer would be able to go work in the aerospace industry. Um, not saying it's not possible, definitely could be possible. Uh, I, I'm just saying that uh, I, I like that because it, it's very versatile. How frequently do you use the skills obtained from a chemical engineering degree? Um, well, uh, regardless of whatever type of engineering you select, right, your initial education is going to matter less as your work experience increases. So the longer you work on your job, the less that you actually do from the, the, the engineering or the, the mathematical perspective, a lot of those skills that you use right up front. Uh, that, that bachelor's degree shows you don't quit. You have a basic grasp of concepts. Uh, you know where to research problems and you can process, you know, you can critical think. Uh, late, later on in your life, you know, your boss isn't going to care about your college grades, but he's going to be concerned how you perform your duties, right? So, something to consider. <clears throat> and how did I start at NASA? Um, yeah, a, a lot of people will contact me, the students and so forth, and ask about how, how to get on at NASA. There, there is a website that you can find. I'll say that a lot of it kind of depends on luck, uh, just because of political, economic issues, hiring freezes, sudden up, uh, openings. Uh, but one really interesting thing that's true now that wasn't true while I was a student is the commercial aerospace sector is really exploding. I mean, you've got all types of companies that are that exist now. We even have, you know, uh, 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 launching astronauts uh, to International Space Station on a commercial crew. So uh, a lot more opportunities are opened up uh, it, within the aerospace industry now. And, and if I was to compare aerospace industry future compared to chemical engineering uh, or chemical industry, I'd say that, uh, you know, first thing, uh, there's definitely a perceived negative environmental impact by oil industry. Uh, whether I'm not saying it's real or not real, I'm saying it's perceived and definitely a lot of people uh, look at it that way. Uh, whereas aerospace future right now is exciting. You know, we're returning to the moon. Uh, we have a boots on the moon goal of 2024 right now. And we're heavily investing in the research and development that's required for a sustained present. I mean, that project I showed you right at the end, the ISRU project, that's a fully funded project that I'm working on right now. Uh, NASA plans uh, uh, on, the, on the opposite side of that is NASA plans are heavily influenced by politics. So what's true right now might not be true if, if uh, you know, there's administrative change. Uh, so that's something that we have to deal with. Um, Private industry uh, is, though, performing what was previously a government-dominated field. Uh, they're picking up our quote-unquote routine tasks, uh, you know, lifting cargo up to International Space Station, for example, also astronauts. Uh, it's great for us. It creates competition. Uh, competition, you know, in a field makes better salaries for talented individuals. And, uh, you know, NASA is uh, performing a lot of the, the R&D and consultation and helping to build that infrastructure that opens up uh, a lot of what contractors are working on uh, right now. And that really concludes everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms I've probably thrown out there. I try to do my best and collect them all off at the end. And uh, that, that's all that I had. I'm looking right now, I've got a different computer screen open. I'm looking at some of the questions that I had. Uh, I don't know, Leonardo, do you have uh, a summary of some of the questions? Um, yes, I, I'm here, I'm Marcus. I, I have the summary of the, the questions. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, epic queue, because some of the questions, in fact, you, you did answer it. Uh, I believe that you answered the question of um Daniele and Thais, she they asked about course courses that she that they can uh, go to enter in this field of uh, aerospace industry. Uh, 
but also we have uh, a lot of different questions. The first one is from uh, Fernando Neto. He's asking if you can tell us a little, a little about the challenges faced by you and or the engineering directory in their team is Moon mission. And he thanks so much for the opportunity to listen you talk. Uh, well, you're very welcome. And I think I understood that the question is, uh, what are some of the challenges that we are facing to go back to the moon? Yeah, he 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 called the the mission name was the Artemis Moon mission. Oh, Artemis. Yes. Yeah, that's our current uh, um, uh, mission. That's like the broad overall mission. Uh, and there's roadmaps that we need to be able to get our technology up to, say, a certain technology readiness level. We're going to call it technology readiness level six. We want to get that up to a certain value uh, to be able to make, to, to push our technology into the schedule. And then it can get picked up by a bigger project uh, for a flight plan. So right now, you know, in the technology development process, you know, you, you start off, you know, very low TRL. Uh, you go through components testing, design testing, you know, formulation testing. Uh, you get to a point where you can develop models that show that test data and then make predictions to develop an engineering development unit. Then you have an, a unit that's more flight-like. It's a flight-like prototype. Then you go through some environmental testing and uh, clean up your models. And once you have that to a point where you're saying, okay, hey, now it's working on the moon. Now we want to get some actual flight experience, right? And start to make it into that roadmap, right? So right now, uh, my, you know, the, the lunar auger dryer that I showed, that's not on there, uh, but there are other projects as well. So it's, it's uh, you know, my crystal ball doesn't work, right? So I can't predict the future. Uh, I, I can just try as hard as I can and, and hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll make something that gets to go on the moon one day. That'd be really great. Great. Uh, I know that you already talked about the opportunities to work at NASA, how the starting the career there works. But Beatrice has a question about, uh, is there something in NASA to um, attract international talent uh, as uh, we have a lot of people watching from Brazil. So uh, is there any special path so uh, a Brazilian chemical engineer can enter in, in ASA or just the regular process of uh, opening selections? I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm not too sure. I know there is requirements for citizenships, for civil servants, but there's different requirements for contractors and we hire contractors. So that's something I can't really answer because I don't have any direct, I haven't ever had to do it. So I don't want to answer you and tell you wrong. I would rather just answer and, and uh, tell you that's something that you got to research. Uh, but also keep an open mind because there is a lot of uh, uh, private industry that's working now uh, doing the same things that we're doing, and uh, you know they're uh, they're all over the place as well. So I, I really don't know opportunities in Brazil. I've actually never been to Brazil. I've been to Mexico, <laughs> but I haven't been to Brazil. Well, consider invited to it since we get all this COVID crazy and madness. Uh, you're invited to visit us in Brazil, in Bahia, and other states that have has a uh, AICH student chapter. Uh, we also have three more questions, so I can go to through them very quickly. Uh, the first one is from Gabriel Padilla. He's asking, what is the size of a team for a project of these proportions? I mean, I, I think he means the all those projects that you, you showed to us. Uh, he wonders how does the integration and administration between your teams works? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what, what, what that, uh, specifically what that question, what you're asking. Yeah, I, I believe that he, he, he needs to know how is the, the teamwork in, in a project, uh, especially uh, this one of the, a, pro, a proportion that is, I don't know, a, a nationwide uh, well, project. I, I'll say, show, show okay, I, I get it. I, I get what you're asking. So, uh, 
uh, you know, you're dealing with people. So there's all different kinds of personalities, right? And, and uh, at NASA, we have a very diverse uh, workforce. Um, this, the, pretty much, we have everything there, right? And, and, and uh, so sometimes there's conflict and, uh, you know, you have to resolve it. And, and that's really, if you've got those skills, that's something, you know, management could be in your future, right? Uh, also, you know, project management is is you're still managing people, but also a project. It's just a smaller scale, you know, focus primarily on one project versus managing multiple projects. But I'll say, you know, at NASA, we all kind of love exploration. So regardless of what your background is, whether, you know, if you have different backgrounds, we all share that common, you know, love of exploration, love of technology. So even when there are differences, they're, they're pretty, they, they can be worked out. So, but it's like with any place. I mean, you're going to have conflict at whatever company. You're going to have bureaucracy at whatever company and red tape. You have to do things that sometimes, you know, they don't necessarily make sense, but they, you know, they're, they're there for a reason, right? And uh, um, so I hope that answers that question. I sure it is. And so, uh, at last but not least, uh, we have a, a bunch of uh, technical questions from João Paulo Pereira. He's asking uh, a, a little about the propellers tests. So he's asking what is the composition and temperature of the propeller support? And also, what is the fluid used to cool the propeller systems? And what is the temperature uh, in average that this fluid I, that, that's that's something I'm going to say. It depends. <laughs> it depends on the engine, and it depends on you know uh, what kind of thrust you're trying to produce. If you're talking about a maintenance or a reaction control engine, right? They're they're going to produce significantly different amounts of thrust. Like a, a RCS engine might be a hundred pound force, whereas you know a, a main engine for Morpheus vehicle uh, was off, off the top of my head. I want to say it was around. It, it started off about 2,500 on one of the original engines, basically able to lift a small car. And I think it went up to 35 or 45. I don't quote me on that because I don't remember off the top of my head. It was a few years ago. Uh, but basically lift small car. But then you start looking at some of the engines like on, on uh, uh, SLS, Space Launch Vehicle. They use cryogens also for liftoff. They use liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, right? So they're significantly more thrust. And the, the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and liquid methane, they all have different boiling points. One of the good things, I didn't really touch on this earlier, of a liquid oxygen, liquid methane system is that boiling points are very similar to each other. So you can put them in close proximity and one is not acting like a heater to the other. Whereas a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen system is, is a lot different. Liquid hydrogen has to be extremely cold. And I don't remember the value right off the top of my head, but you can easily Google that. It's, it has to be extremely cold, whereas uh, liquid methane is or liquid oxygen is pretty cold, but it's, it's not like it. So the liquid oxygen actually acts like a heater to liquid hydrogen if you put them close together. So uh, you have to design your vehicle and you have to design that system with all those kind of interactions in place. Also, liquid hydrogen is a lot less dense than liquid methane. So that was one of the other reasons why we were looking at liquid methane. Uh, the more dense it is the smaller your tanks can be liquid hydrogen if you look at some of those tanks they're huge like on on shuttle for example those big orange tanks and how 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 or the big orange tank right in the middle and then the two on the small sides you can see how big they are and, and what they require for that propellant versus uh, uh liquid methane and liquid oxygen can be smaller um, not saying there's anything wrong with liquid hydrogen because that's actually something that we are looking for uh, on the moon as well but you know, once you increase your height of your tanks and you increase your volume, uh, you change your center of mass. So now landing becomes a little more difficult because now your center of mass is much higher than it's easier to land when it's lower. So there's a lot of little other things, little interactions, and and that was you know a little topic I mentioned that you know systems engineering is very important, right? It's fun to focus on on your technology and on yours, but you have to know you know. What are my upstream values? 
what am I getting? What's my my temperature, my pressure? What's my density? What what are my conditions coming in? And what am I giving to the downstream system? And when I change something here, do I make this problem downstream a lot harder for the other guy? Right? You can't just say, oh, well, I'll let him figure that out, right? You, you've got to make those interactions. And that's really a skill for project management, right? That's where you have to, to talk to each team and make them all kind of uh, work together. Great. Uh, just I th I say that this was the last question, but I, I realized that I missed this one more as well of João Paulo. Uh, he's asking if these batteries that you showed to us, they were responsible for testing and for develop helping developing. Uh, they're used for both uh, manned craft and sa satellites, or they are different. There, there was definitely some batteries that have flown in satellites that have flown on a space shuttle before it was retired uh, that are used on uh, space suits. Uh, there's batteries used for all different kinds of things. And, and some of the, the, the technology developments that we've had for safety has definitely made uh, batteries safer for on the ground use as well when those when they're applied they're not always required to be applied because you know people don't typically you know abuse their batteries like we do right i mean put them in an oven or whatnot right people shouldn't be doing that at home uh so but if they did there might be a safety device in there because that's that's some of the stuff so so yeah a lot of the stuff that we work on indirectly affects uh things on the ground as well great so that's it uh we read all of the questions and uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, oh, Mr. Collins. Uh, it was a, a very pleasant time. It was uh, actually, it was very, uh, uh, a very interesting moment because uh, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, AICG now has a, a competition called Kemi Car. And we have to develop uh, a car that is propelled by a chemical reaction with, without using any battery or fuel that is commercial. So while, while you were talking about the, uh, the challenges of developing uh, a new battery, uh, some, some, kind of, uh, some kind of drop of troubles sound similar to, to me, and I believe that to all of the AICHG student chapter members that are also participate of this competition, obviously, with all the proportion of developing our chemical car and developing a battery, a battery for be used in a spacecraft. But uh, this shows how uh, these areas are connected and how us as a student of chemical engineering uh, can take advantage of the knowledge that you uh, showed to us today, tonight. So thank you so much for this, for being so uh, open for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Hey, you're very welcome. And good luck on y'all's competition. That sounds like fun. It really is. Thank you. All right. So uh, in name of the AICH Brazil, I think once again, uh, the presence of Dick Collins, the NASA for allowing us to have this conversation, for having this presentation to us internationally. I also thank you all this that was present that were present here during this streaming and i remind you that this streaming will be recorded so you can watch it later in the youtube and be uh, aware of our social medias if you know any of the student chapters that organized this event if not if you can look it in the instagram or in, at google our names AICG Brazil and you can find us to future events. Thank you so much and have a, a good night. Thank you. What in the world do chemical engineers do? Make life-saving medicines accessible to everyone. Develop and deliver new energy sources safely and responsibly. Eliminate plastic waste from our oceans. When it comes to getting things done, chemical engineers have a pretty full to-do list. We do the math, science, and engineering to make medicine accessible, water drinkable, air 
breathable. The deep thinking to make the environment sustainable. Systems affordable. Safety reliable. We make discoveries scalable and the inconceivable feasible. So what in the world do chemical engineers do? We take things that have never been done and get them done for good. AICHE, doing a world of good.